everyone, and welcome to the Forward Thinking Podcast. It's Chrissy here from CS2. Today, I'm joined by Chantelle Marcel, and she's a marketing consultant who focuses on growth marketing for B2B tech companies. We're excited to have Chantel on. She she's well known across like LinkedIn for sharing her expertise um, around building communities and content, and really engaging uh, your buyers. And we wanted to have her on to share that with our our guests and talk about the growing demand for you know community managers building a community, why it's important, and why B two B brands should care. Um, and also how to operationalize that, because I know some of you are in operations and yeah. talk about maybe some key things around doing that. So welcome to the podcast, Chantel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Great. Um, so yeah, so before, before we dive into it, can you just give our listeners a little bit about your background? Cause I know you started in, um, PR and social media, but I've also had roles across digital marketing content. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how you got into that and, um, how you got to where you are today? Yeah. So like many marketers, I started out thinking I was going to be in journalism, realized I wasn't really going to, uh, have a lot of stability there. So I pivoted into PR, which is kind of a natural progression for a lot of journalists. You're just on the other side of things. Um, and then I realized that that kind of felt limiting too. So, I had joined um, kind of a startup environment and I was working with the CMO and uh, the CMO ended up leaving and there was just like this void. And so uh, like a lot of people who work at small companies, startups, you get to have these crazy opportunities that just pop up. And so I was able to step into the marketing role and start learning all about that world. So that was uh, my start in marketing and I've been in it ever since. I I love the versatility, the variety, no two days really feel alike Um, and really working for startups and small businesses. You end up getting to wear so many hats and try so many different things that um, I think I've become sort of what I like to, what I've heard people refer to as like a Swiss knife uh, marketer or whatever. Yeah. Um, or sometimes yeah. we call it a T-shaped marketer because it seems mm-hmm. like you have a big focus on content, but then you're also able to do a lot of the other tasks um, that, you know, a marketer needs to be good at as far as like being, you know, tech savvy, but mm-hmm. also uh, know how to like build a strategy. Um, so, so yeah, we've had, we've had others like that, but yeah, I think that's really important, especially for for startups, you know, they look for, for people who can really, you know, take on different tasks because it's always changing as far as like what's needed from day to day as you start to build out your strategy. Um, as you expanded your roles at, at the startup and went into marketing, did you, well, how did you find like the parallel between like doing journalism and then, uh, you know, doing content for, for a tech company, like, what were the big differences and was it, was, was there anything you had to like change fundamentally about the way you thought about like writing and engaging um, the reader? Yeah. So there's a lot of crossover there because at the core of everything, you know, you're telling a story and it has to be cohesive. It has to be relevant. It has to resonate with your audience. Um, so I think that by starting out in journalism and really getting this really strong, Uh, foundation in knowing how to write and really knowing how to write something that is, you know, the inverted pyramid or whatever. You start with the important stuff. You focus on that. You figure out the best way to convey that. Um, You know, it just being a good writer, I think, is a really critical skill for all marketers. Good writer, good storyteller. Uh, even in my most recent role, I was doing uh, performance and a lot of focus on uh, data and analytics. And, you know, that stuff is worthless unless you're using it to tell a story because you can yeah. give people all the numbers in the world and it's not going to make sense because there's no, uh, there's nothing to tie it together. There's nothing to help them to visualize what that actually means. Yeah, definitely. We we talk about that a lot on the podcast because, I think so many people just focus on just 
building reports, sending it over the fence, like throwing it over, building out these. And, and to you, to the person building it, it's saying, oh, this is giving the people exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. But without having that like data fluency, like it, and also, you know, people don't have time to really just like stare at a dashboard, analyze it and come (laughs) up with the story. So you do need to really be able to tell, tell that story. So a hundred percent stories telling, I agree is, is, an amazing trait for a marketer and also just the ability to like market your own marketing internally. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you tell that story to your executives and, and also to the rest of the marketing team, uh, and sales team even. Um, so I think, um, you know, one of the things we want to focus on today is community, but I also, you know, given your background, you, uh, you do put a lot around, uh, content strategy and how, and, and this probably goes into the rise of the community, but how has like content strategy like changed recently? And do you feel like there's, there's a more of a focus on really engaging the prospect and customer? Like I think before, you know, it was content was all about how do we just get people to fill out a form and <laughs> like, so we can nurture them and send them down the funnel. And, and over time that, that kind of diluted, I think the, uh, the way content was being created and even how much time was spent on it and like what value is providing to the person. Like, do you think that's changing and how do you think that is changing? Yeah. So you're right. I think that before it was kind of like this gimmick that you used to get people in just so you could put them into your, your CRM and (laughs) mark off another MQL. Okay, here we go. We're good. Um, We've got another like lead coming through the funnel. Uh, But then you were starting to see that there wasn't really a lot of value there when you just pad things with people who you've essentially tricked into (laughs) joining your funnel. Um, So I think a lot of people are becoming more aware of the importance of um, really valuable, relevant content, content that is designed to be very specific to your audience, to the buyer persona that's going to fit best for your company um, and helping to like bring them closer to your brand, developing that relationship with them. Uh, understanding that there's not going to be possibly an immediate conversion or, uh, you know, revenue generation based off of one touch point or one uh, activity that you've done, sort of looking at it more big picture. I think a lot of content strategists are also learning the uh, importance of, like we were talking about, being able to tie the data in with your content. So building that into your content plan. So saying like, what are our KPIs going to be? What are we measuring here? And how can we prove the value of this uh, with dollar signs attached or with something attached to it so that the executive level does uh, understand why we're doing this? Totally. Do you, how do you feel though about like, like gating content or like, you know, putting up some barriers to like receiving your, your content? Because like you said, you want uh, KPIs around your content, but do you find that some people will just fall on, okay, well, let's just put a form in front of it so that we can measure this effectively. Like how, how would you say, like, what's the downfall maybe to doing that? And are, is there a better way to measure the success of your content without having to like gate everything? So my background, I'd done a lot in SEO as well, both like on-page, off-page content, technical SEO. Um, And it is really important to have valuable content featured on your site that isn't gated at all so that people can just access it. They start to realize that you do have something valuable to offer them. You're not just someone putting out fluff or clickbait or whatever. Um, If people can't trust that you're going to offer them something, then that gate just seems like, um, it seems like a trick. I think a lot of people now are very wary of the form because they're like, oh gosh, I'm going to fill that out. You're going to fill my inbox with spam or with, you know, SDR stuff, messages, you're going to bombard me. And I'm not interested in that right now. Like I just want to get some, what's in it for me? What can I get from this right now? So, um, if you are getting something, 
I think that people really need to make sure that there's like some serious value that you're delivering to ask for someone's contact information. Um, so the most valuable pieces of content, I think it's fine to gate it, but it would better be something that you've put a lot of time, effort, resources into creating something that's going to really provide some serious immediate benefit to the person who reads it. Totally. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. And I think we talk about like, um, I think to your point, like, I think if some giving someone the ability to do their own research, I think the way that people buy now, there's so much that they want to just consume on their own. But Mm -hmm. then if they are ready to talk to you, make that like, seamless like make it really easy like have your chat bot there make your demo requests like really simple to put on time on someone's calendar so by the time that they are ready you know that and fill out that form or you know have that experience of um putting in that request that you can um they'll do it, you know, like, and Mm -hmm. if anything, that's a great lead to send over to sales instead of someone who maybe just downloaded one piece of content and and is like, whoa, I'm really not ready. Um, These are all things that seem kind of basic, but you still see people (laughs) doing that, right? Um, And I think part of that might just be that um, it's hard, you know, it's like, it's a habit that's hard to break for some just because they're a bit scared about what, what's that impact on my top of funnel. Um, Mm -hmm. but really like they're focusing on volume rather than conversion rates. So, um, right. Yeah. It frustrates me that like, you've got like a form for the content and like, there's so much like attention put there, but I filled out a ton of forms where I'm actually asking someone to contact me. Like, I'm like, I'd love a demo. I'd love for like you to contact me ASAP. I'm like very ready to buy. And then there's this long delay for them to actually get back in touch with you. Like the processes are just very off. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm so happy you said that because I do, <laughs> I, I agree. And it's something that like, I, we really harp on is like, and part of that could be just that other like sheer volume of like leads that you're sending over to SDR. So the ones that really do need to be reached out with you know, don't get that due diligence, or maybe there's so much focus on, like you said, that like those other activities, but then when it comes to the one thing that you want them to do, like the, the process has been neglected and maybe there's some gaps there. So, um, yeah, I a hundred percent agree on that. It does seem a little bit, a little bit backwards there, but, <laughs> um, this is a good segue. Cause I, I think, um, you know, there's content and how we engage our prospects and customers. But one thing that is really, you know, on the rise is just around um, building a community and using that as a way to engage your prospects and customers. Um, Also social media, which is kind of a community in itself, especially on LinkedIn. Um, But I, I wanted to get a sense from you, like, what is a community to you? And like, how do you define that? Yeah, that's a tough one. And I think a lot of brands struggle to really think about what the definition of community should be, and especially for them or whatever their needs are. Uh, I really view community as a group that shares vision, mission, interest. They have these commonalities that unite them um, behind some common purpose. Um, And, you know, they're all adding value to each other. So they're all looking to uh, help, support. Uh, Sometimes you see brands that have communities where the focus is too much on the ultimate like sale at the end, so the conversion. So they really look at community from uh, a perspective of uh, selfishness almost rather than uh, adding the value to the people who are there and who have like volunteered to to join that community looking for benefit for themselves, not really looking to, um, you know, buy your stuff. Yeah. Do you, do you have an example of a community, like you don't even need to name it, but can you give an example of a community that you think does, does it well and like actually has the right kind of mission or, or I guess outcomes that they're tracking, um, based on like the experience that's great for the, the user. 
Mm -hmm. Both HubSpot and Salesforce have incredible uh, community building strategy. Um, they invest a ton in it. I know HubSpot just launched their new hub fans portal, um, which, you know, is supposed to be targeting toward connecting their users and providing them with resources and opportunities to get involved and to elevate their personal brand. So that was really exciting to see. I think it just launched um, very recently. And then of course, Salesforce, uh, just incredible the way that they've um, united people, uh, not just behind the product use, but also like, you know, there are people who are Salesforce moms or like, yeah. you know, it's just awesome. The, the way that those two brands in particular have, have shaped community. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like, uh, comparing just like a company versus a community it's it's interest like it's something that you like can almost like hold your you feel proud to like be a, a part of that or like there's there's something it even bridges like micro communities out like within their community mm -hmm. you know so like um even just a b2c one like peloton or something like you look at yeah. the way that that they build community. And I mean, I, I use mine and I, I feel, <laughs> I always feel like, you know, and then you have like Peloton moms and then you, you know, mm -hmm. you get like, you can track your own like friends there. And so it's just, but it, it becomes less of like a company just giving, you know, a, a bike to, or a treadmill to, oh, this is part of my life. It's something that I'm so mm -hmm. immersed in that like, I just want to continue to do more and more and talk about it with my friends. And it, it's so natural, right? And it becomes super aspirational. Like speaking of Peloton, I'm like so jealous looking at everybody else who like <laughs> is involved. And I'm constantly like, I really need to get one and just like set it up in the corner of my like office. I I'd love to yeah, but it, it also creates like the desire for other people who are looking at that and seeing that like experience makes them want to join as well, which then lends itself to growth and more awareness for your brand, of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, what what do you think like for, for B2B brands who maybe want to build a community, like what are some of the benefits or outcomes that you think they definitely would, would be able to like nail down or track, like what I think for, for any company, it's good to like map, you know, some of their roadmap and goals to ba back to like defined outcomes. What do you think that would be if they were looking to build a community? Yeah. You know, I, I host uh, a community podcast. And so that's something I always ask the guests because, um, you know, data is so important and at the executive level, a lot of the things that we do in marketing tends to get whittled down into like these data points. Um, and so for community or for social media, for content, these are things where it's really hard to tie them to specific pieces of data and especially pieces of data that matter at the executive level, which always yeah. comes down to revenue. Um, I think, you know, it takes a lot of sophisticated mapping of you have to uh, figure out how to operationalize things and to build processes right from the beginning. Otherwise you'll start and have no direction and nothing to, to show from it. Um, you know, I think some of the data points that are important are like growth, how many users are involved, uh, engagement, um, you know, but then looking at the lift across the board, a lot of times you'll do something on this side and you'll see a, a sort of um, lift in other areas uh, that you wouldn't have seen, that you didn't see before you started activating in this one area. So I think that measuring against all channels and seeing what the lift is, it, you know, could be a great way to see, are we seeing, you know, people moving through our cycle a little bit quicker, especially if they've been involved in the community. Are we yeah. seeing, you know, that these individuals, this cohort, is, you know, spending more or um, is having more conversations externally, referring back uh, more additional users. Um, I think things like that can definitely be useful to, to track. 
Yeah. It's one of the things we talk about with attribution. Like in, in some cases you do have to do some like implied attribution just because you can't mm -hmm. tie something directly to, you know, an opportunity, like they source that person. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. If anything, a lot of the things that you should do in marketing today is probably not going to be picked up by an attribution tool or mm -hmm. not the right way because there are things that are just like purely just hard to track, like word of mouth or, you know, like, like someone who's on your community. Yes, they might engage with a campaign, but just them even being part of that or engaging with other people. Like if you have a community that where you can have prospects and customers, you know, the customers are speaking on your, you know, your product's behalf and, and the prospects, you know, listening to that. And then they might come to your website. Now that's just, depending on your tracking, that might be like direct traffic or right. not being sourced correctly. But so really, like you said, I like the idea of like tracking a timeline and then looking at Lyft. And then if you can tie your user, um, you know, engagements back to, you know, your CRM or something like that, that's a bonus. But you have, like, I think marketers just need to get more and more comfortable investing time and money into things um that do you know build this like sense of community build um raving fans even though it's not going to show up maybe on that dashboard right and i think that the partnership with sales also becomes important at this point too because they're having those conversations regularly uh when i was working in the pr you know field a lot of times the ceo i you know meet with him and he'd be like wow, the salespeople have really been saying a lot of people have mentioned that they read this press release. That's not something necessarily that I'd be yeah. able to have any sort of, yeah, there's nothing I could have measured there, but those conversations that they were having and coming back and just sort of, um, you know, hearing that over time, I think really helped us to see that there was value in this, but we wouldn't have gotten that information unless sales was willing to bring that in. Um, you know, you've got to sort of beg them to possibly document that in the, yeah. the CRM. But even if they don't, just mentioning it, I think over time can, uh, it starts to have a, an impact on the mentality of the rest of the, um, the company. Yeah, like I, it's, it's something we've chatted about too, but I, I feel like there is some value to just like anecdotal data or how you're, you could even like through surveying, like you have, cause you have your internal, uh, you know, users or internal stakeholders, especially with sales and they do have direct access like to the prospect and customer. So are the, there are these perfect times for them. I mean, it could even be a, a icebreaker sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. how did you hear about us? Like what right. got your interest? Um, I always suggest like, maybe that's part of like the, some of what you capture on those initial calls and you, you know, you track that back to like the meeting or the opportunity and just getting some of that, those details back to marketing. I can, I think is so useful because a lot of the times, like we can make assumptions in marketing about like what's actually, you know, driving uh, revenue, but there, there's, you know, not all, uh, like buyer journey is, uh, you know, specific to just like one thing or one driving thing. There's multiple things. And some of those are a bit, uh, you might not weigh, or you might weigh more than the others. Um, and so asking the prospect or customer is like a great, great source. And like you said, sales <laughs> is, you know, huge for that. And, and, I guess I'm part of that, like, um, you know, having that feedback loop with them makes them part of the process, which then gets them more interested in what's going on, I think, on the marketing side, too. Right. And they then get to see the benefit of what you're doing for them. Like, yeah. oh, wow, you're actually like you wrote this press release and it actually is bringing in more people or you posted this to the community and it actually did um, drive traction for us, made our lives easier. Yeah. Um, so for one question I had was um, if you had any insights or even preferences around like how brands should maybe build a community. So if that's like having a platform or, you know, 
using a Slack channel or something like that? Like, what do you think are some of the ways that B2B brands are, are doing or, or using anything at all? It could be they're just using their own marketing and, um, but what do you think is like the, some of the best ways you've seen recently that companies have operationalized building a community? Yeah, you know, I think that there are some easy points of entry, especially with small companies or startups. Um, you may not have the resources to manage like a massive uh, community that, that gets started or an additional tool even. Um, social media, I think, is one of those easy points of entry where you can, you know, get started pretty quickly. Um, it's quote unquote free, not really free, but you know, it, it um, you can at least join and start something up without uh, too much of a cost. Um, and it, you know, you're going somewhere where people are already active. So you're not asking them to necessarily leave what they're doing and spend time in a certain dedicated environment. So that does help you to uh, avoid that hurdle and, um, gain some some quick growth if you're able to develop some engaging content that fits within uh, the communities that you're looking to engage with. Uh, going beyond that, there are you know tools that um, there are a ton of tools available right now. Um, so I mean like Slack is one of them, Discord. Um, there are other tools, uh, Bevy. Um, so it just depends on the amount of lift that I think a company is able to take on uh, if they have dedicated managers who are able to help manage that and to grow it because too many times people start up a community and don't realize how much it actually will take and how much investment it's going to require. And so you've got this community and then you don't know what to do with it or you realize you can't actually manage it. There's stuff going on and you're just like, you know, I don't have time to like uh, sit here and facilitate conversations or to make sure that all of my users are following the guidelines and, you know, being respectful of each other. Um, it can be really tough to, to manage a community. I think that's something people should be mindful of before they actually start. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm one of the co-founders of Women in Revenue and I started up our like Slack community when I was on maternity leave. And we were really lucky because there was, I think given like we're a nonprofit and we put out education, there was, there was not this like, you know, and everyone was just, you know, super respectful of each other. But um, over time, like you, there, there definitely needs to be a strategy going in. And I think luckily we had some of that, but then it needs to evolve and it's something you need to dedicate time to, or mm -hmm. figure out a way to get your members to almost drive that community for you, like through ambassadors right. or anything like that. So do you have any suggestions for like, who should be in charge of like owning that community building and like maintenance and are there ways to you know, get more lift by leveraging like an ambassador program or something. And what would be some of your suggestions for doing that? I think that for a community to work really well, you've got to have somebody internal who is able to um, manage the strategy at the top at a high level, at least. And mm -hmm. even if you've got that ambassador program, you've set up moderators. I think that's awesome because it really does then start to feel more like uh an actual genuine community that's like grassroots or whatever, less like yeah. a brand that's sort of imposing on um, people. Yeah. Um, but of course, they're going to need some support. They're going to need, you know, messaging. They're going to need some guidelines as to what you're trying to do and making sure that they stay really aligned with your brand's mission and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I think otherwise it becomes too easy for it to evolve into something that may not actually align with what your brand is trying to achieve or what your brand values are. Is it somebody else who's managing it? And, you know, they've all got their own agendas or views and, you know, you've really got to be the one to drive, um, drive the steer the ship, I guess, so to speak. Yeah, definitely having like those guardrails in place and, I mean, even for certain users, I think it's good to also build a sense of like, uh, you know, rules around like what's, what, you know, what do you want to see from the community itself? Because sometimes I think 
other people can try and take advantage of community and mm -hmm. you know push their own uh, stuff onto your community members and having those rules around like what is like what should be allowed what shouldn't mm -hmm. be um i think because we want you want it to be a safe space i would say you want it to be a, a space of learning engaging sharing ideas and uh, it can be tricky when that then bridges the line of people wanting to use it as like a selling tactic. <laughs> yeah, right. Or when you're attracting people who don't, you know, align with your brand values. Uh, yeah. You know, every brand should have a pretty well-defined DNA or something that, you know, defines um, who you want to engage with. And I think, you've got to keep that in mind with the community as well, because it's very easy for a community just to sort of spiral out of control. And you're, especially when you're just focused on growth instead of intentional growth. And then you look around and you're like, well, this doesn't make any sense for our brand anymore. And then, yeah. you know, you've got to go through the difficult exercise of, well, how do we correct it? How do we, do we have to, you know, completely abandon it? Um, there was this interesting story about the New York times. They had a Facebook group, uh, it's supposed to be dedicated to like cooking and it was tied back to the cooking section of the, um, the publication. And over time it grew so rapidly and they hadn't set up enough resources or people to manage it that they ended up taking their name off of the group and sort of abandoning it to uh, the group itself. So they like turned it over to some of the, the members of the group and said, it's yours now. So wow. <laughs> very very good lesson, I think, on what, what yeah. could happen if you're not, you're not being intentional about things. Yeah, that's so interesting. Wow. And I, I haven't heard about that, but that's, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I think you also, I think given going into it, if you have like, uh, you know, some intentions around like what, what the values are, it's kind of like when you like internally, you know, you have your set of like values, um, when you do like your hiring or anything right. you do internally, it should like roll up into those values. And I think you can take some of that and apply that to your community. And then that could be where you have like guidelines around what does that community mean? Are we, is everything we're doing upholding like to those values? And when it doesn't, you know, that's not allowed or, or we don't do that or, mm -hmm. but there needs to be someone who's really like controlling that to to make sure that that's happening. Right. And you want to like scale the growth as well. So if, yeah. you know, your internal resources are only able to manage this amount of uh, effort, then you don't want to grow too quickly because then you won't have that level of control. Totally. Yeah. I know both you and I um, were moms to, to two-year-olds, <laughs> which we just found out before this, but I think one of the things that I learned and I think could be applied, like when you become a, a parent or you all see even a mother, like instantly you feel part of this like community of like other mothers, right? <laughs> Where you, and you seek out communities because you're like, I need all the information about like this and that. And it almost gives you a sense of, um, you know, knowledge, especially when it really speaks to like what you're going through. And you feel like more empowered to do it because it can be overwhelming. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things, a lot of issues and something you could have never prepared for. So if we take that back and we think about, okay, you know, say you're selling a platform, there's a lot of information you need to know. There's a lot of things you need to do. It can be, and you might be the one person at your company that's like in charge of, you know, rolling that out or using it. If, I think without a community that can feel like a really like daunting thing, or you might not feel like you can get like your ants, your questions answered, or you don't have any like-minded people that you can maybe roll some things off of with. And so I compared to like, okay, taking on this other endeavor. Yes. It's not as important as maybe raising a human, but having the, <laughs> having the resources around you can be so useful and so impactful on your success. And so when retention is super important for, for companies, especially SaaS subscription-based companies, like, um, you know, it seems almost like, uh, an obvious thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, let's look at Salesforce, for example, they've got a massive platform, very technical. Uh, There's so many different features, so many different uh, use cases. So having these little micro communities that help people sort of navigate the experience and make the most of things, uh, incredibly valuable and incredibly meaningful to, you know, all of the all of their customer base, or even people who are potentially interested, you know, um, communities don't necessarily always have to be just your customers. It's probably going to be a mix of, you know, potential future customers, people who may never use your platform, figuring out how to add value to all of them and help them to just, you know, address some of those pain points that are common to whoever you serve um, really helps to, you know, define your brand in a way that transcends business. It becomes like people can look to you and know that they can rely on your brand for more than just, you know, basic products. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And that is just like longevity, like it ensures longevity, you know, when it comes down to like renewing, like, how could you not when you're just so built into like that, you know, the ethos and the community and like, you know, everything that they're offering. Um, Mm -hmm. So to, 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 to end my last question is, and I always like asking this, but what are, what are some of the things that you see like B2B brands doing wrong when building a community or engaging their prospects and customers? I know you, you mentioned the New York times (laughs) about like not having a moderator, uh, which I think is one key thing, like really go in knowing who's going to own it and who's going to maintain it and, and what work it would be involved. But do you see, see any other things like that people do wrong that um, that's pretty common? Um, yeah. So, I mean, beyond what you had kind of mentioned where people join and then just start trying to sell to your community and there's no like strict guidelines that say, no, anybody can't just come in and try to take over and, um, you know, steer things in their own direction. Um you know, I had started a community for a very new um, startup previously, and, you know, it was one of my first times starting one that was completely just dedicated to the brand. And when everybody was joining, I kind of realized I didn't know what happened next. Like, I kind of just expected us all to join and start like talking, like, <laughs> like on social media, you just kind of tweet something out or post something yeah. on LinkedIn and people comment, but here it was like, okay, well, people need a reason to like share content or people need a reason to actually talk and engage. Otherwise they're all looking at you like, okay, well, you need to tell us what happens next. Like you asked us to come here. What are we doing here? So you really have to have something ready to share or create an engaging environment because otherwise there is nobody else is going to set the plan. Like nobody's going to join and then do all the work for you of like starting conversations and making sure everybody is like active. That's really all on you. So I think before people start a community, they've really got to have that plan ready. What are people going to do when they come here? What am I asking them to do? And what am I offering them? Why should they be here spending their time here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it feels like that happens all the time. Like we, th- we think that the thing, the, like the destination, the platform, whatever, like that strategy, it's like, no, 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 no. That's not the strategy. That's just <laughs> like the tool that's going to help you implement your strategy. Your right. strategy is the, like what happens next, the journey, the content they're engaging with the value, like that's all the strategy. And that is all needs to be defined like the, like you said, the platform in which you do all this might even be like the least important part, because Mm -hmm. if it doesn't even support your strategy either, it's not going to be successful. Right. You've got to focus on the people because community can happen anywhere as we've seen over the past year where everybody's now online. So it's all happening. A lot of it is happening online now. Yeah. The people. I like that. We, we've been talking about that a lot. Cause I think a lot of the time people focus on like process data technology, but really it's like people process data technology, people's number one, your internal right. people, your resources, your external users. And so it's super important. Um, 
Well, to close this out, I know you mentioned that you have your podcast, but can you just tell our listeners a little bit about where they can learn more about you and also talk a little bit about your podcast? Yeah. So, um, I have my website, chantelmarcel.com. Um, you know, there are links to all of my social media handles. I'm pretty active on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and then there's also links to listen to my podcast episodes. Uh, I'm actually doing a rebranding exercise right now and figuring out, uh, what that's going to look like, but, um, that'll be going live pretty soon. And it'll still, of course, be focused on getting value out of marketing, Um, but I've spoken to a lot of, uh, community leaders and, um, people who have done some amazing things with building community led growth, um, at their businesses. So. Very cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll have a link to your website, uh, in the description of this podcast. So those of you can go back and check that out. And I also suggest connecting with Chantel on LinkedIn, or at least following her, give her a follow because she shares a lot of her insights and um, best practices over on LinkedIn as well. Um, but anyway, thank you, Marcel, for jo- uh, Marcel, Chantel, for joining. <laughs> we were just talking about how your name rhymes, and of course, I screwed it up. Um, no, people do that all the time. It's like they're both kind of first names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you, Chantel, uh, for joining us. It was um, very nice to have you on and, and share your expertise on on something that I think is super important. So, for those of you who enjoyed this episode of Forward Thinking today, feel free to share it with your colleagues and friends and we'll see you next time. Have a good one.